This is a presentation of cyborg assemblages, how autistic adults construct socio-technical networks to support cognitive function, presented for CHI 2023 in Hamburg. I am Rua Williams and my co-author is Sharong Park. We are from Purdue University. I am the PI of the Collaboration Lab and this project was partially funded by the Just Tech Fellowship with the Social Science Research Council. First, some meta information. This paper is not a paper about autism. This is a paper by autism. The authors, the participants, the premise, the method, the analysis, and even the paper itself are all neurodivergent. This paper is based on a theoretical assemblage of multiple complementary theoretical frameworks, including design justice, prioritizing inquiry that centers the most impacted, treating autistic participant testimony as expert tes testimony. We are looking for what is already working. Crip Technoscience Manifesto, where we are understanding and reimagining socio-technical systems and relations based on the experiences and expertise of disabled people in everyday life. This project is also deeply entangled with cyborg theory, which is a working body of theory coming out of disability studies and science and technology studies that disabled people have always been the first cyborgs. We are already in body minds of human machine symbiosis and that what makes us cyborgs is the mind meld of body and interface. When you use an app, you have to open it, usually close a pop-up ad about upgrading to pro or whatever, or deal with those distracting ads. And then you have to navigate a new interface and find where you input your data and then do that and maybe save it. Too many steps. I mean, I'm not trying to compensate for my brain not meeting my expectations. I'm trying to compensate for my brain not matching societal ableism. In this paper, we take a focused look at executive function, which are the cognitive processes that govern motor planning and task initiation, memory, and goal-oriented behavior. This is a primary domain of concern as expressed by autistic people themselves in numerous bodies of research. And despite this, less than 10% of HCI interventions for autism focus on executive function. And when they do, they tend toward a clinical rehabilitation model rather than an adaptive and assistive technology model. There are, of course, notable exceptions. For example, the My Calendar Project and TangiPlan. Executive function is the ability to imagine some kind of desired future state maybe make a plan for how to do it, and then be able to trust myself that I will take these steps and be effective getting close to that desired state I initially imagined. How to do stuff. How to plan and execute what you mean to do, when you mean to, and how you mean to. Just doing what you mean to. Except it's also really, really hard. We are, of course, reliant and in community with scholarship by neurodivergent scholars in HCI that challenge the interventionist mindset and inspire new research directions and co-creation, counter-narrative, and speculative design futures. I just want to note out the names Kelly Mack, Emma McDonald, Catherine Ringland, Luann Boyd, Kata Spiel. The method of data analysis was also an assemblage. We are working from Tillman Healy's friendship as method. And it wasn't actually that they were my friends, it was that the method of interaction was a method centering I, like a conversation of care and affirmation. Braun and Clark's reflexive thematic analysis, augmenting that with Martin and Somerville's cooperative interactions framework, which may be familiar to people from CSCW. This work is not possible without the critical work of Jennifer Rode and her descriptions on, of digital ethnography and making the idea of uh, ethnography and digitally distributed communities possible you see a sort of a progression chart, which is showing how reflexive thematic analysis and the cooperative interactions framework are integrated and assembled in this paper. Not only are we familiarizing ourselves with the data, but we're doing this with a lens towards sequentiality and temporality in the data and the relationships between the ecological and the arteriological. And when we iterate on this understanding of the data, we are looking at plans and procedures and routines and patterns. When we generate our ideas of themes, and we are also looking at distributed coordination, both between human and machine and human and human, and at awareness. So how aware are participants about the kinds of connections that they're making? 
Then as we develop these themes, we are looking at ecology and affordances, and we reflect and refine, and then we write. And when we write, we write in the form of an impressionist vignette, which is called for both in Somerville, Martin and Somerville, and in Jennifer Rhodes' work. It took a long time for me to open up and be more honest about things or ask for help. What helped me open up was how they have always been pretty open about their struggles with executive dysfunction, burnout, or overload. Or like, days where words are hard. I never considered myself to be non-speaking before, but recently, through these friendships with other people who are like me, I've been able to let down the layers and layers of masking and have days where I can't communicate in words, only pictures and emojis. Or days where I ask my friends to help me remember to do XYZ, and vice versa, where I provide that accountability and support. When we're looking at the strategies and methods that autistic people are using to integrate their environments and their executive function and using technology to mediate that, we came up with these four primary domains in which they were implementing these strategies, mental, embodied, social, and environmental. Mental would be like have setting routines and rules, using your technologies as extended cognition, gamifying your personal chores and habits, breaking down a task that seems too overwhelming, embodied, using sensory regulation to help you work through moments when you feel like you can't move. My participants found that multitasking was actually an important part of being able to regulate goal-oriented behavior. Socially, borrowing each other's executive function, being able to do for others what you can't do for yourself, or even just being in presence with each other in order to get through tasks. Environmental, there's a lot of control of space, light and sound, using objects as reminders. From the data and from this construction of like domains of strategy, we developed three vignettes. Someone who is struggling to get by but is doing their best, but also seems fairly isolated um, and hasn't, hasn't made connections with the community of support. And moving towards someone who is um, more intentional about being able to reach out to people for help. And then the third person who is literally living in personal and digital community with other autistic people and finding affirmation and joy. Moss grunts as their alarm beeps at them desperately for the fifth time this morning. They reluctantly rise, sort through unfolded laundry, select their favorite shirt and jeans, and head out the door. As they leave, they pass a stack of unused planners, but a note by the door reminds them to grab their wallet, keys, phone, and to check that their backpack has their headphones and sunglasses. Moss puts on their headphones and sunglasses as they exit their apartment building. By blasting their favorite music, they can remain calm as they wait for the bus at a crowded stop. Someone bumps into them as they board the bus, and they sense a flood of overwhelm. Quickly, they reach into the pockets of their hoodie and find a fidget ring that they use to calm their nerves as they wait for their stop. The sunglasses will help prevent them from getting a migraine, and they leave them on as they head into work. They nod to their co-workers as they settle into their desk. They check their calendar to see that they missed a doctor's appointment by accident. They haven't found a reminder system that works for them. Moss does their job well, but they always feel like they are one mistake away from catastrophe. They check their phone and see a chat notification from a friend. Moss thinks about telling them how difficult things are for them right now, but they don't want to be a burden, and they don't know how their friend could help anyway. I've seen other people do this, where they directly came and supported each other when they had a hard time functioning, but I haven't done that. I've always had the sense that it would either be a burden or they couldn't actually help me. Leaf wakes up as the lights in their room gently fade on. Last year, they purchased a set of smart lights and programmed them to adjust throughout the day in a way that supports their sleep schedule. Leaf pulls a pair of pants and a shirt from a drawer and chuckles at how many of the clothes are the same cut in different colors. They like what they like. Leaf works from home, so it's very important to them that their space is well delineated so that they can maintain a sense of routine and order even though they don't often leave the house. Their desk is tidy, but only because they force themselves to clean it every night so that it is fresh for them the next day. As Leaf settles into work, they realize that their stomach hurts and that they are getting a headache. They sigh with relief because they have built an entire library of preset emails and detailed how-to documents so that they can continue working even when they don't feel their best. 
Leaf often feels guilty when they think about how flexible their work is. They worry about other autistic people who don't have the autonomy and freedom to control their own lives. At noon, their smartwatch vibrates gently with a reminder, eat a sandwich. At 12.15, they realize they still haven't eaten when they glance at their calendar and see the color-coded block of time labeled, no really, go eat. At 12.37, they get a text message from their friend, have you eaten yet? Leaf responds, yeah, no, and laughs when their friend sends them a selfie with a bowl of cereal. Leaf goes to make their sandwich. Echo wakes up when their cat, Tizzy, demands that they be fed. The cat has obviously never been fed before in its life. As they head to the kitchen, they pass visual aids on the wall that their roommate uses to communicate and to remember tasks. The truth is, everyone in the house uses them, even though they are only for Abby, who is non-speaking. There's a sticky note on the cat food bin that reminds Echo to give Tizzy medication with breakfast. Echo adds Tizzy's medicine to the bowl. Then they make themselves a bowl of cereal and take their own meds. They look at Tizzy and say, <laughs> what a pair we are. Echo looks over and notices the paperwork for their legal name change is sitting unfinished on the kitchen table. They groan. They have had the forms for four months and can't ever get through them. They text their friend, why are forms? Their friend responds, lol, mood. Their friend is trying to apply for a new job, but keeps getting frustrated by the online forms. Echo starts a video chat with their friend. Okay, we both hate forms. We both have forms. Let's both fill out forms. They sit online together, working through their paperwork. Occasionally, one will complain about their form, the other commiserates. In just 20 minutes, they both have completed something they had been putting off for a long time. What a pair we are, says Echo. Executive support squad activate, says their friend. Echo remembers a time when they felt embarrassed and ashamed about their forgetfulness and disorganization and would never ask for help or tell other friends that they were struggling. They are so grateful now to be living in physical and digital community with people who care for one another. Mutually supportive relationships are hugely important and are also one of the things I hadn't figured out until I was an adult because nobody had supported or suggested such a thing when I was younger. I needed to both get to know other autistic people and learn how to try and live on my own and crash at that to find that others were also struggling, but we could struggle together. I can't be always on, and I wonder if the way that things like ADHD and autism are classified leads to the implicit standard that to be normal is to be perfect, and therefore to be functional is to be infallible, and so if we are to function to the standards of normies, we can never goof off. Thank you for listening. My handle is usually Fractal Echo. You can find me under that at Twitter and on Mastodon.